Greetings and salutations. This is Abe Abdelhadi with The Bitter Truth, where we ask a lot of questions, and you may not get all the answers, but at least you got some of the questions. My guest tonight is an incredible woman from South Texas. Her name is Emma Hernandez. She ran against Beto O'Rourke in the primaries, and if you don't know who Beto O'Rourke is, he did win the Democratic primary, and he is going to run against Ted Cruz. And if you don't like Ted Cruz, and I don't either, uh, that's who's going to run. But I'm not a big fan of Beto O'Rourke, which is why I called Ms. Hernandez to have her come on the show. And I wanted to talk to her about her, her, her unusual campaign, her stratospheric results, and just really get into some of what she's about. Because I really, really respect what she's doing, who she's about. She's not your typical um, political policy wonk, and that's why I like her. So, uh, Sema, are you there? I am here. Hi, how are you? I'm excellent. I'm glad you came on and, and uh, joined me tonight. Uh, we're just kind of getting started, and, and I'm really honored to have someone of your caliber on the show. So um, let's talk about a little bit about you and your background and how you got to where we're talking now. Well, it's a very long story, but just to make it short and sweet, I'm 32 years old. I'm a daughter of immigrants, of migrant workers, and I'm the first one born in the United States of my entire family. Uh, oldest of, I think, five five kids. And um, I'm a mother of four boys. I've been married for almost 15 years. Uh, background in healthcare and uh, volunteer baseball coach. I'm an activist and organizer in my community. And, um, you know, going into politics was never the plan. It was never the the intention. It just kind of you know, went into, well, what else do we have to lose? And we, if we're, anyone's going to save us, it's going to be ourselves. Right. So instead of complaining, why not just do something and start running and, and use all the skills that I've developed uh, over my lifetime and just jump right in? And I did. That's phenomenal. And then, so, so okay, I, so I, I saw you before the primary, about a month before the primary, and, and shame on me for not paying attention until about a month before the primary election. Uh, I started digging in a little bit, and I wasn't crazy about Beto O'Rourke, um, whose real name is Robert, if you're listening, listeners. Um, and I found you, and the other candidate The other candidate didn't really strike me. There's a third person whose name is escaping me right now. But what got my attention about you was your incredibly progressive platform, and you chose to run, if I'm not mistaken, you chose to run as an independent. You didn't run as a Democrat. Is that right? I ran as a Democrat. Oh, you did. Okay. But you didn't run under the DNC banner. How, how did you choose to run? And, and, and tell me about your campaign and, and how you raised money. All right. So how I chose to run was simply as, as a human being, as, as an independent person under the Democratic Party. Um, I've been a Democrat for a while and I've always voted Democrat, but I didn't consider myself an actual Democratic Party insider. I just, you know, voted Democrat based on who's running and always a platform, not on identity politics. When Bernie Sanders came around and I, I saw who he was, he was an independent, but he ran as a Democrat for president. Um, I said, okay, you know, if I run as an independent, it's going to take a hell of a lot more, um, signatures to get on the ballot. If I'm not mistaken, it takes about 47,000 signatures to get on the ballot. You can't even pay your way to do it. You either have to run as a Republican or Democrat, have 5,000 signatures or $5,000. So I started fundraising and it was difficult because, you know, around that time, Hurricane Harvey happened and our home was flooded. Our neighborhood was flooded. And instead of going out there and asking for money campaigning, um, I started to roll up my sleeves and I went out there in the water with my husband, rescuing people out of the water, opening up our home to the people that were in the neighborhood because we did have two rooms that did not flood that we could accommodate people to stay with us. So it was difficult with Hurricane Harvey and my husband losing his job and us losing our family vehicle to campaign. So I turned to social media, put my story, what's going on? I'm still running. I'm not deterred. Um, at all from continuing to run. Most people would have thrown in the towel. I did not because I saw this as something much more bigger than myself. Um, this was a, a campaign focused on human rights and social justice and breaking the cycle of corruption. Wow. So, okay. So um, when you went on the fundraising campaign, how much, how much money did you raise? 
it was about ten thousand dollars. Wow. And and okay, so the primary came, and we're gonna get into more of this in some detail because I, I you know we we talked before, and I definitely want to talk to you about your relationship with the O'Rourke campaign. But um, the the primary came, and the vote count was you guys you guys got how many votes and Beto O'Rourke got how many votes? All right. So the ten thousand dollars, five thousand of those dollars was used to pay the filing fee just to get on the ballot. Okay. To campaign across the entire state of Texas was about four thousand dollars. Well, and, and then with those four with those four thousand dollars, I was able to earn uh, a little bit over a quarter of a million votes. Quarter million votes to Beto O'Rourke's six hundred and seventy five thousand votes. Correct. And he spent four point eight million. I literally spent one tenth of one percent of what he spent. <laughs> and I love this because yeah, yeah, listen, as soon as Chuck Schumer showed up, I'm like, Okay, this guy's an asshole. I, I I just he wasn't taking PAC money, but he was he was cagey about the corporate money. I I, I wanna get into that in a little bit here too, but I mean so um so what was that like? I mean, because obviously, you know, his campaign had to be concerned, if I'm not mistaken, um, as these things often happen. So what was the dialogue between the two campaigns? What what were they trying to get you to do or not do? Well, both campaigns, meaning the Ted Cruz campaign and the Beto O'Rourke campaign, did send their occasional spies to try to infiltrate my campaign, but since they didn't necessarily see what was going on in the background, they thought it was just me campaigning. Um, but little did they know that because of my contacts and my history and activism, um, everyone was a volunteer. No one was paid. Every single person that came on was volunteered. So they didn't see an office. They didn't see a staff. They didn't see a bunch of uh, people running around like you would normally see in a, in a typical campaign. So that was unusual. So I guess they didn't think that I was a threat. But it didn't, money really doesn't make a campaign. I mean, it does, but to an extent, it's messaging, it's policy, it's making sure that, in my case, I wear my heart on my sleeve. My policy was out there, my issues were out there. I had um, people on my campaign that were volunteers for Bernie that worked directly in their fundraising campaign and strategy. Um, amazing people from across the entire United States, including Mexico and Australia that were helping get that message out that were on my volunteer list and email list to just spread that message. So everything was literally grassroots. Whenever Chuck Schumer came to Houston, it was about maybe two or three weeks after Hurricane Harvey, and he had a fundraiser, a joint fundraiser with one of the biggest DNC funders uh, in Texas. All right? And they had it right in the middle of one of the most devastated areas in Houston. So here's this guy profiteering and campaigning, and the Beto O'Rourke campaign is authorizing Chuck Schumer's uh, Senate campaign, the the DCC or DFCC campaign PAC fund. It's called Impact. Okay. Impact PAC was funding. um, Well, sorry, the money was going into Beto O'Rourke's campaign from Chuck Schumer's fundraising in Houston. So I'm beside myself. I'm thinking... We just had a hurricane. It devastated Houston. And you're here to what? To to profiteer? To fundraise? And then one of the most devastated areas? No, that that was wrong. And he does take PAC money. In that case, that that PAC is a a PAC money by Chuck Schumer. And he does take corporate money. It's just in smaller amounts than you would see with with a super PAC. Okay. Okay. And so, and, and then you guys grew up in the same area. Am I wrong? I completely. He grew up in El Paso. I grew up um, anywhere between Florida all the way to Michigan, South Carolina, North Carolina, and Texas. Okay. Because, again, my, my family, migrant workers, they went to where the season was for picking produce. So you know, having a different lifestyle from O'Rourke is certainly striking because, again, he grew up in a wealthy family, I grew up in a family that literally was living in a mobile home, and we were packed in a mobile home, and then we would go and uh, pick oranges or tomatoes, watermelon, jalapenos, apples, uh, you name it, my family picked it. Right, 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 right. No, my dad was, uh, when I was a kid, um, my dad's from the Middle East, and he sold door-to-door for a few years in the 60s when he first got here from Brazil with my mom, and... Um, 
around 67, 66, he got turned on to um, migrant farm workers. He was what you call a fayuka. And so he would go sell to these guys who couldn't leave the farm. So he would go and, you know, clothes and hats and ghetto blasters and things, jeans and stuff. And so my little part-time job uh, for a few years was I would go on the weekends and sell tapes to these guys that my dad sold me for a dollar. And, and then I sold for three bucks, two for five. So I knew who Los Tigres del Norte was and Los Bukis and all these guys. And so, which is kind of where I learned my Spanish because my mom spoke to us in Portuguese. And so I was growing up, growing up in LA. And anyway, so I saw the different conditions depending on the ranch and the farm. Some of them were super generous. And they had almost dormitories and some of them were just the most cruel places I remember being 12 years old, getting back in the car with my dad and crying, you know, because these guys like live in these broken down trailers and just, you know, 11 guys to some, you know, not even a mobile home. I mean, I mean, like a, tr- like a tow trailer and they're just sleeping on top of each other, making like at the, in the seventies, like three bucks an hour. So, you know, you, you, you can't make that more of a point uh, as far as the difference goes in terms of how you came up compared to how Robert O'Rourke came up. And I want to use his real name because we talked about that a little bit because I thought when I first was hearing about him. I, I've been here three years from, from Los Angeles. And when I was, you know, looking last fall, who was running and everything, you know, Beto, I'm like, okay, great. You know, maybe his mom's Mexican or something. And that's how he got the name. But no, he's like, he's not who he claims to be or tries to pretend to be. Am I wrong on that? No, you're absolutely right. And that goes into um, his, his political family history. His father was a judge. And there is articles out there of his father going on record that he named his son Beto because he was preparing him for a future in politics and being that we live in Texas, predominantly Latino, he saw that that would be a benefit to his son. So that, that was his name. That See, his, his and, 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 and it's funny because um, before I got here this afternoon, I was hanging out with some buddies, getting some beers in the afternoon. And I knocked off work early and I knew I was going to do this. And I thought, ah, I'll, I'll hang out with my guys. We watched the World Cup, you know, Portugal and Spain. And my buddy Ruben was there and I was telling him that I was going to interview you. And he was like, oh, I, I didn't know who she was really. And I said, yeah, dude, she was, she's awesome. And then I was telling him a little bit about Robert O'Rourke. And he goes, what? I said, yeah, dude, I thought his mom was Mexican or something. So I got Beto. He goes, no, man. I'm like, and he was really disappointed by that because he bought into the whole, you know, the kind of a con because from El Paso to here, we're not going to know. We're in Austin. That's like eight hours away. And so unless you know the intricacies of the family history, like you just kind of outlined a little bit, it's 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 kind of a con because you're not going to know. And it's almost like he's appealing, trying to appeal to, say, the Cruz voters, you know, the heavy Latino population, say, in San Antonio. And so it's it, it's kind of offensive. I mean, so I know your campaign dealt with his a little bit. Why don't you tell me a little bit about that? Well, our campaign dealt with him towards the end. Uh, we, we tried to get him in the same room to debate me, but he didn't acknowledge me throughout the entire campaign. Uh, he pretended it didn't exist. When we reached out to, to have a debate, um, he wanted it in his town on his terms with his people. And I said, no, uh, you don't get to do that. If there's three of us. It's myself, Robert, Francis O'Rourke, and Edward Kimbrough. There's three of us. Why does it have to be where you're at? Why do you have to continue to impose your privilege upon us. That, that's not right. If you are truly running to be a public servant, then you do it in one of the biggest cities in Texas, the fourth largest city in the entire United States, the most diverse city in Houston. Why don't you do that? So when I finally got him in the room and sat down with him uh, for an hour and a half, this was about a, almost two weeks after my campaign. He was calling me, asking me for help. He was calling me to come and work on his campaign. And I I said, if you don't sign on to Medicare for All, you can just forget about it. If you were, you really want to be Cruz, then you need to listen. And they kept te- texting me back and forth, me and the campaign managers, because it was just difficult just to get him in the same room. And I said, look, I'm not going to meet with someone for 30 minutes. It's not even worth my time. And frankly, it's an insult. Wait, um, and let me stop but, you for a hot second. So meet with him in a, in, privately, not in a debate setting. Correct, because okay. he wouldn't debate me. Right. So it was okay. after the primary. So he wanted to meet me and talk with me for 30 minutes. And I said, if that's an insult. Um, my time is better spent building a movement than to try to um, accommodate this privileged politician. 
Um, if he really was serious about meeting with me, then it's going to take more than 30 minutes because I have a lot to say. So two weeks after the primary was over and I got about 25% of the vote, we finally sat down in Houston. He flew down from D.C. to, to meet with me in Houston. And I talked to him and I didn't, I wasn't disrespectful. I kept my composure, even though every part of me just wanted to jump out of my skin. Sure. Uh, because of the things that he put me through, um, the things that, that his campaign did and said, um, or his volunteers said about me, was completely disrespectful. To not acknowledge me was disrespectful. And it was disrespectful to what I represented, um, which was people in poverty, uh, the injustice in the system that we are currently living in, that he helped perpetuate. And I told him the very least that you can do is uh, sign on to Medicare for All, HR 676, you need to support 5 for 15. How is it that you want me to campaign for you, but you're not giving me a reason to support you, a reason to vote for you? I can't do that, and I cannot turn my back on the people that supported me by falling in line to you. Um, how, how can I explain that to people when he threw DACA under the bus for more military money? Okay, let me stop you right there. That- okay, let, let me stop you right there for a hot second. I got to ask this. So he threw DACA under the bus with a ton of other Democrats. Is that yes, right? He did. Okay. Yes. So, and I, I, and I can't, I hate Ted Cruz with the burning white intensity of a thousand suns, but I'm not seeing, the more I dig into Robert O'Rourke, I'm not seeing much of a difference between the two, except for the t- fact that Ted Cruz is a Christian jihadist and he would like to put the death penalty on abortion. Um, where is the real difference voting-wise with these two guys? Voting-wise, they vote the same. They do. Wow. They, <laughs> honestly, they do. They vote the same, and people will tell me, well, there's a clear difference, and I would say yes. Wow. They, one clearly is more attractive than the other physically. <laughs> the other one is obviously looks like uh, that one guy from the Munsters. Yeah, um, uh, the the uh, grandpa, grandpa yeah, for the that, grandpa, that for, yeah, grandpa for the Munsters. Al Lewis was the actor's name, by the way. If you're going to IMDb right. it, yes, yes. Cool beans, uh, but it, I really don't see a difference either way. We lose. They are both part of the same system, corrupt system. Neither one of them is bold enough to call it out like it is. And frankly, both of them whitewash America's history. Well, and before I jump into, before I jump into a couple of other questions here, I want to ask you about that because the other day I saw your tweet where he put up some stupid, ridiculous, like America's built on hopes and dreams. And you called him out on it and you were like seriously gangster about that shit. You blasted him. And I'm like, good for you. And you you so so tell me about that a little bit. So he when he when you say he whitewashes, like like where what's his vision of America or version of what he thinks America is now, say compared to yours? Well my my version of America is of course far more socialist than anything. But the way that he put it that America was built was, it wasn't built on fear. It was built on courage and the imagination, determination, and hard labor. Um, no, it wasn't. It was built on the backs of the bloodshed and genocide of my indigenous ancestors, of my ancestors. It was built with the hands of my enslaved black and brown brothers and sisters. This is not a pretty picture. This is not something that can easily be whitewashed or turned into some sort of fairy tale, because that's not what it is. Right. I would have liked him to acknowledge the atrocities that happened and that we should do better and the policies that he is putting forth would reflect the remorse and reparation that have been truly needed for, for generations so to, where, to the so, people of this country. So where's Robert O'Rourke on defense, for example? Well, and that brings me back to the meeting that I had with him after the primary when I'm telling him, instead of funding these wars, because I said, you approved $700 billion for military, instead of funding money towards college, you tried to impose conscription bills instead of actually funding, you know, college for all for, for public education. Wait, back up. Conscription, you mean draft, the draft. That is the draft, yeah. Okay, so, so the so-called left, the so-called Democratic candidate is pro-draft. 
he is pro draft. But I want to make sure we get that across to our listeners. I mean, so 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 Robert O'Rourke going by Beto as a fucking white guy is pro drafting people. He sits on the Armed Services Committee for the House of Representatives. I mean, what do you expect? I'm I'm, I'm asking you directly because you're the expert and I'm not. So otherwise I could talk to myself for an hour. But (laughs) so he is pro-conscription. He is pro-conscription. He is pro-militarization. He is not for 5 for 15. He's not for living wage. Mm. He is not for Medicare for all, single payer, HR 676, which is what the bill is called in Congress. Okay. And the original author is John Conyers, which he is no longer uh, in the House. Right. But that bill now is in the hands of uh, Keith Ellison. So, Who's retiring. Uh, Keith, Keith Ellison is stepping down. He's not going to run again. He is. And I'm wondering if that has anything to do with me pressuring O'Rourke to talk to Ellison and Ellison not returning my calls to follow up if O'Rourke actually talked to him about H.R. 676. If if Ellison is no longer leading the charge on H.R. 676, then who is? Does the bill die? Right. Does someone else take over? Right. Does this allow someone like O'Rourke to come in and change it to where private entities can profiteer off of Medicare for All? Right. These are serious questions that people need to ask themselves. And it's not about, you know, wanting Cruz to win, because I, I don't want him to win. That's the reason why I ran. I, I was the epitome, um, the complete opposite of what Ted Cruz stands for. Sure, sure. The complete opposite. And having someone like O'Rourke, who didn't even turn out um, a million people to vote, a million people to vote. It, I went up against Beto O'Rourke, but look who was backing him. Right. It's Wall Street. It's Walmart. It's big oil. It's big pharma. All of these people were funding his campaign. So I didn't just run against or Warger Ted Cruz, I ran against the literal Wall Street establishment. You ran against the Wall Street establishment, you ran against the DCCC, you ran against the DNC, yeah. and Chucky the Schum, which is who I like to call, and I'm stealing that from yeah. somebody else, but Chuck Schumer, and Nancy Pelosi, and the entire establishment who doesn't think we need to change. These are the very people that, when I talk to them, friends of mine, who hate Trump with a blinding white intensity of a thousand suns, And it's almost like they're letting him steal their critical thinking skills. I'm like, wow, you're mad at him, but not the system that gave us Donald Trump? That's like being mad at the meal and and not blaming the chef. And that's the thing that that drives me crazy about all of this, what you're saying, is that um, you ran a campaign, and this cannot be reiterated enough. You ran a campaign on $4,000. And you got a quarter million votes to the DNC Golden Boy, the Oscar De La Hoya of the DNC. And I, I and no offense to Oscar De La Hoya, because I actually liked him before he started to suck. Um, I was going to say. Yeah, I'm just saying. <laughs> the last three fights were were crap, but anyway. Um, but but he's their gold. He's their guy. He's their handpicked guy. He spent about six bucks a vote. You spent point zero zero one penny per vote. And you you near you nearly halved what he did. And meanwhile, to anyone listening who does live in Texas, Ted Cruz got a million seven votes, which means all Republicans showed up to vote for that guy. And the DNC, the Democrats, the so-called left, could not care less. And why is that? Because they keep putting their thumb in the eyes of progressives. They keep putting their thumb in the eyes of people like you who do care and do have an agenda for the people. You're not just trying to go get some salary or, or get big oil money or big pharma money. You actually care about who is in your state and what their needs are. And that doesn't wash with these people. I mean, for 45... Well, it, 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 go ahead. I'm sorry. You know, I'm saying it, it doesn't. And it, it bothers them that someone like myself, a in, in their eyes, a nobody who doesn't have political experience, comes in and completely dominates the narrative because I know the issues. It's not something I read in a book. It's not something that I witness from afar. It's something that I've lived. I have been in in the cycle of poverty for as long as I can remember, and it bothers them for me to bring it up, So, which is why it's so natural for me to come on to the Poor People's Campaign and work on that because, again, when I ran, it was never about me. Right. It was always about the issues, and sure. that's what I focused on every time I campaigned. I brought the issues up and out. 
in the in the faces of people that didn't want to talk about the issues. They want to talk about the fairy tales. They want to talk about, oh, America's so great. Um, no, it's not. America, where we're living in, it might be a great country on paper, you know, the ideas on paper, but when in practice, it's not. It's very oppressive to have a a country that we're living in where so many people are living below the poverty level, that's ridiculous. It's inhumane. Where so many people like Mr. O'Rourke and Ted Cruz and all these people in Congress, the one percenters have health care, but then they turn around and say, yeah, we want better for you, but you have to pay more. That see, is inhumane, and, and considering that, how how we're living. See, and, and that's the thing that, because I want to touch on a couple things that you, to piggyback on what you're saying, that's one of the things that drives me crazy. My day job, if you will, is I do employee benefits. So with the healthcare issue, what's funny is I'll talk to the most conservative pro-business guy. And when I spell out that a 50-person company, that employer is paying $2 million a year for healthcare. Two million, a million and a half to two million, depending on how much they use their healthcare, which as you know, you use it, it goes up. And you'll see people, I'll go do open enrollment every year. And some of these people will get like a 28%, 35% increase. And then the employer's like, hey, we'll pick it up the first year. We apologize. So they're taking it up the butt for ever on this healthcare thing. But if I went to an employer and say, hey, listen, 50 people, 2 million bucks, it's gone. Your Medicare contribution, which is minimal, goes up by say 10%. I go to the employee and I say, instead of 300, 500, $1,000 a month, Depending on your needs, you don't pay that at all. And the Medicare that you're already paying for goes up by 20 bucks. Meanwhile, Congress kicks in an extra $50 billion and Medicare for all is achieved, done. And I, I am so sick and tired of these people saying, well, how can we afford that? Well, how can we afford war? We're paying a, mil, a trillion three right now, a trillion with a T, 0.3 million, trillion dollars every year now for defense. When you count VA, nuclear, covert, and the budget that, that Cheeto Jesus got, by the way, which you can't have it both ways. He's either the craziest person on earth and he can't have nukes, but yet unanimously, almost unanimously, with, a hand, with the exception of a handful of Democrats and Republicans, his budget request for defense was approved with an $80 billion extra bonus that they just gave him without asking. Meanwhile, education, which was free, college was free when I went to school 30 years ago. I paid 100 bucks a quarter where I went to school. And now it's $5,000 a quarter to go to Cal Poly Pomona. And so like, when you talk about the no differences between Beto and Ted Cruz, where are they on education? I mean, has he voted differently at all? Or did, I mean, you, you, you know better than I do. Well, they have both voted the same and they have the same ideology when it comes to public education. They both support um, chartered schools. And if I can go a step further, uh, Mr. O'Rourke's wife runs a charter school in El Paso. Ugh. And he has written articles on Medium um, explaining why he voted a certain way, specifically to charter schools. So when it comes to school choice and things like that, both of them align very well, uh, Mr. Cruz and, and uh, Mr. O'Rourke. They're both the same. Okay. Now, I have my children in a public school system. My children have gone to charter school, a public charter school, not private. And that that was good. And I wish that everyone could, you know, pick, pick a school that they want to. But I shouldn't have to drive so far to take my kids to a good school. We need to fund public schools. That way we don't end up leaving them and make sure that our teachers are paid a decent wage. Right. And they're able to join a union. Right. But if we're not funding public schools, we're not funding the future. We're not. But both of them follow in line with, with Betsy DeVos. I would much rather have funding for public schools. That way my kids can go and I don't have to worry about moving them to a different district. Well, see, we, and we used to have vocational training in schools. I mean, and this is where my little, you know, conspiracy theory button kicks in. The Department of Education started in 1981 under Reagan. And I got to wonder if that's not an entire conspiracy to dismantle public schools because I went to Los Angeles Unified School District. I grew up in South LA, you know, now known as South Central. Um, and we had decent schools. I, I remember going to my 10-year reunion and there was a ton of guys didn't go to college, ton of guys. 
but they were able to get auto and metal and wood shop classes and drafting classes. I got I got a friend of mine who works in LA County right now, and he's in the engineering office, whatever you call it. Never got a college degree. His drafting skills out of high school got him the job there, and as he moved up the food chain, I mean he's he's making a great salary, and he's been there as long as we got out of high school, 35, 36 years, he's going to retire with a full pension and everything, do da do da total total opportunity just because of a public school education. Um, my 10-year reunion, there was, a, there was a bunch of guys got out of school at 18, didn't go to college. And, you know, they, they're all, you know, I lived in LA, so, you know, their uncle was in the union, whatever, got him a job as a plumber, got him a job working on the sets at Warner Brothers or Universal. They're making like, and this is 1991 money, making like 40 bucks an hour with full benefits. And they're putting their kids through school and doing all this life stuff. And you're going, wow, but why can't we have nice things? You know, that, that why do these, we, we subscribe to this death economy where crony capitalism rules and we insist on fucking the worker. And when you're talking about, about a better work and Ted Cruz, I'm like, except for the fact that Ted Cruz wants to put women to death for the for, for getting an abortion. I mean, w- there's not much of a difference, is there? I mean, I'm just, I, I seem kind of flummoxed by this. Well, the, the one thing that I, I can say that O'Rourke has voted on that seems somewhat uh, favorable is voting for reproductive rights, voting for, um, hmm, let's see, automatic voter <laughs> registration. Okay. Um, and... There's one more bill that I don't remember what it is, but it was on the summer of progress, and it was uh, it was a it was a team, a group of people that put this together, different organizations, should I say? Uh, it was with um, our Revolution Justice Democrats, and um, I believe it's brand new Congress. It was a summer of progress, and there were certain bills on there that that would have would have been great for him to sign, but he only signed three. I can only remember two of them. Okay. One of them is reproductive rights and automatic voter registration. That's that's about it. Okay. That is about it. But everything that he's that he's saying on the campaign trail are all platitudes. Um, if he really meant what he said, that he would follow through by introducing legislation or voting on current legislation that is already there. It's already there. He doesn't need to change anything. Just sign on to it because it's fine. And one of the things that he did say during our one and a half hour meeting is that he wasn't going to sign on to H.R. 676. And I said, but if you're willing to sign on to Bernie Sanders' bill in the Senate, you know, if you are elected, it's an easy transition to make from H.R. 676. Like, I, I supported it here in the House. It's going to be an easy transition to support it in the Senate. I said, even better, if you support it now, because you should have supported it then, if you support it now, you will get a lot of people's attention. It will elevate you as a candidate. It will actually show a distinction between you and Cruz. And I said, on top of that, it is a very popular bill. Everyone wants it. I said, hell, I want it. I don't have health insurance. I need it. How is it that you have health insurance, but you deny us health insurance as well? It doesn't, it doesn't sit well with me. And so he says, I'm not going to sign it. I don't care if it's popular. It's not something that I'm going to sign. Wait, those were words? Those are his words? Yes. What a dickhead. Those are his words. Those are his words. He doesn't care how popular it is. He's not going to sign it just because it's popular. The three-term, the three-term congressman who's got the same health care that John McCain has that saved his ass with his brain cancer. I know he's going to die pretty soon, whatever. He's 80-some-odd years old. He had a great run. But And, and by the way, those of you that want to write cards and letters because I made that comment, my philosophy since I've been 10, if you can make it to 80 – and past that, it's gravy. 80 is about the bare minimum. So God bless John McCain, but he's got great health care and he's 80 some odd years old. He had a great run. So you're telling me that this guy with that health care plan is perfectly willing to tell you to your face that he's going to deny that to the people. That is exactly correct. And, um, he doesn't know this, and a lot of people don't know this, is that during this one-and-a-half-hour conversation, I recorded it. Oh, well, you should get that to The Intercept, because that could be very um, Jason Crow, Levi Tilleman out of Colorado, if you know what I mean. 
Well, yeah, but it, again, it was more to protect myself and making sure that he doesn't come out of the meeting thinking that I endorsed him or gives a false narrative right, 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 of right. our conversation. Sure. That was to protect myself and to show people that, look, I tried. I tried to reason with this person. Mm-hmm. I tried to get Medicare for all. I tried to get the living wage. I tried to get college for all. I tried to get so many things on my platform, which I did send you the platform. It is a long, progressive platform, but I'm not going to go into the negotiating room and ask for crumbs. I want the whole damn pie. If right. I leave with two slices, right. it's a win. Right. Absolutely. Well, and, and here's the thing, too. I mean, you, you make an excellent point because one of the things that somebody asked me the other day, you know, well, well, your show seems like it's not very both sides. Like, you know why? I'm, I'm, I'm 54 years old. I'm fucking tired of both sides. Um. We, we, we freed the slaves in the 1860s under Lincoln, and we barely stopped hanging black guys in 1970. So don't tell me that we can take our time and incrementalism is okay. I'm fucking over it. I'm tired of this like, well, why can't both sides get along? Because one side sucks. And one side happens to be a oligarchical duopoly with the exception of, say, gun control and abortion and gay rights. That's it. The, 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 it's, it's one big party with two wings. One is the crazy we believe in angels wing and fuck the little kids in the cages. And the other wing, the other side of the wing, the party, is that we like gay people. We don't like guns. And, you know, we're, we're pro-choice. That's it. And that's high-end gossip. Do I give a shit if the president is teabagging some stripper? I could give a fuck. The fact that we have troops on the Chinese border right now, the fact that we're bombing the shit out of the Middle East still, yet we keep telling the American people that, oh, they hate us for our freedom. And there's like a good percentage of people that still believe that crap. Meanwhile, you're sitting in the room with this guy who's supposed to be a a supposed liberal, I won't say progressive, but a supposed liberal. It turns out he's a corporate democratic policy wonk. So in that 90 minute conversation, what else went down? Well, I told him that even if I did a coming campaign for him, it wouldn't feel right because no. he's given me nothing to give to the people, right. especially after he threw us under the bus. I said, if you're going to want me to come and help you beat Ted Cruz, then give me something to work with. I said, because you have no problem voting for these militarization bills. You say you want to bring back the troops, but then you turn around and give more money, not earmarking it for veterans. I don't understand how that works. In, right. in your mind, but it right. doesn't work in mind, and I cannot justify me supporting you if you can't even give me the most basic human decent decency to just approve these bills, to write these bills. Right. And quite frankly, we're we're tired of incrementalism. I'm so tired of people telling me to fall in line. Um, he's not talking about the issues. He's just saying nice things. Mm-hmm. He is. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I need him to talk about the issues because if he really wants to be Ted Cruz. He needs to talk about the issues. He needs to address white supremacy. He needs to address the injustice system that we are living in that completely exploits us Mm -hmm. for their own capital gain. That's right. He he doesn't do it. So I said, going forward, right now, my top priority, H.R. 676. And he says, okay, I'll write it down. I'll talk to Keith Ellison. Ah. And then he turned and he said to me, you know, um, National Nurses United supports the Anders Bill. And I said, yes, but they also support H.R. 676. That's what they want. Uh, you're in the House right now. It's natural for, for them to want you to do that one now because that's where you're at. See, and this is – okay, so I want, I want to back up a second because I, I know you hear this because I've gotten crap for this too, and I'm not even on your level. I'm just a guy – who goes to the occasional barbecue, hangs out with his buddies in bars, right? And I live in Austin, supposedly blue, but it's just more wonky Democrat than actual progressives. So I'm left of those guys. I look like a crazy person to most of my friends. But you're not, this isn't about you. I'm I'm sure you get the crap that, oh oh my God, you're supporting Ted Cruz. If you do this, he's going to win. It's not about that. It's It's about the fact that hating Trump is not a worldview, Right. This is what this is what these woke people. A lot of my friends, I'm sure yours, too, and, and I'm older than you are. So I've been getting a lot of this in the last couple of years. Forty five, 50 year olds, friends of mine know me a long time. And they're like, oh, my God. Well, you used to say that crap at parties. And I used to think you're so negative, you know, 
And all of a sudden, I look like a prophet overnight, and they're asking me questions like I'm like like I'm Moses. I'm like, well, I don't know. R- read a paper for Christ's sake. Don't you know? And 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 look at something other than Washington Post or goddamn Rachel Madcow, because her she's bought like Sean Hannity is bought. They're, they're they're the same goddamn media. That's why you see the same military analysts, quote unquote, of which is like twenty four hundred ex generals and military officers who have defense contracts, six-figure defense contracts, I'll say, and then they go on to TV, Fox or MSNBC or CNN, telling the American people, we need more B1s, we need more this, more that, and they're getting paid at CNN, profile goes up, they write a book, they make more money, and we're thinking, oh, well, that guy's a military analyst, he must, you know, whatever, it's one big fix. You know, war is an entire racket, and you got this guy in front of you telling you to your face he in no uncertain terms am i wrong he wasn't subtle was he no he wasn't subtle um a lot of the time whenever i talked to him directly i always looked him in the eyes i didn't shy away uh when i wasn't talking he looked at me but he always tried to look away but i i wanted to make sure that he knew that i was talking to him and it was only just me and him in the room so there was really no one else that could intervene or interject or just, you know, give their own opinion or influence. I wanted him there so he can see me and know that I'm not controlled by anyone. These are the things that the people want. These are the things that I fought for. These are the things that we all need. And I said, I have more to lose than you. When I ran, it was for all of us. The moment that I lost, we all lost because you. I know you're not going to fight as hard as we did. No. And you're not going to campaign as hard as we do because you don't live our truth. You don't live our oppression. You don't live in poverty. I said, you're privileged. You're rich. You'll go back to your millions of do- millions and millions of dollars. You'll go back to your, your firm, your lobbying, whatever it is you're going to do. I said, but I go back to my home in Pasadena where I live three miles away from the oil refinery. My husband works in the oil refineries. He's in danger every day of, of getting killed. And I cannot bear to look at my children and say, this is, this is all we could do. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to go quietly into the night and just give in to someone when he has no idea what it's like to live in poverty. He says to me, I was born lucky. Mm. And I said, no, no, you weren't. You weren't born lucky. I'm lucky I even made it this far. I'm lucky I even made it to where, you know, where I'm, where I'm 32 with four kids. I said, and it's hard. It's hard being a parent. I said, I have four kids. Right. I nursed all of them. I coached Little League Baseball for them. I coached baseball while I was breastfeeding in the dugout, waiting for my <laughs> husband to come to a baseball game, tired as hell from working a 12-hour shift in the hot sun, you know, opening up those little pipelines for the, for the chemicals to run through to refine the oil that we're pumping out of the ground that is polluting our environment and causing our health care, our health to decline. I said, you don't know what it's like. I have to go back to that because you were hell bent on stealing this election, on on winning, but you have nothing to fight for. I do. That was gut wrenching to just do it. (laughs) Well, and, 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 and this is, and I am not speaking down to you at all. Um, just, just, just to preface that, but because of your age, I have to say this: you're 32 years old. Um, my youngest brother is a little bit older than you. He's he's 37, and um, I came up. I'm 54 years old. I came up in a different time. I came up in South LA, where we had job jobs, where the minimum wage was about a buck 25 back in the day. But if you got a union job, say at Bethlehem Steel or General Motors, which those jobs were, were quite plentiful, um, you were making about seven, eight bucks an hour. And this is in the 70s when minimum wage was $1.25. My parents charged 90 bucks a month rent for a two bedroom apartment. That's the economy back then. And what people don't understand is like, you know, f- friends of mine across the street, you know, their dad was a mechanic and, and mom had a job and they had a house and two cars and took vacations. You know, uh, another guy's dad worked at Sears selling shoes like Al Bundy from uh, uh, Married with Children. And they were still able to afford to have two cars and a mobile home, you know, and buy a house for $30,000 and take vacations and, you know, not, 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 not going, to the, going to Monaco or whatever, but, you know, having a life 
and putting their kids through school and college was free. You know, to give people a perspective, because two, two years ago, um, I'm in Austin and I had another job at the time and I had a lot of conservative friends at that job and I was pro Bernie. And they're like, oh yeah, you're a pipe dreamer, man. You fairy duster. I'm like, well, let me ask you something. Where, where'd you go to school? And as soon as they said they went to a state school, I knew I was going to win the argument about my age. Where'd you go to school? UT, Texas State, anything. I go, oh, oh cool. Well, how much did you pay? Oh, shit, man. I got out in 88. I was paying about 300 bucks a semester. Uh-huh. It's 12 grand a semester now to go to UT. My old school was 100 bucks a quarter as a service fee. Now it's five grand a quarter. I got friends your age that just got out of Cal Poly about five, six years ago. They, they, own a, they owe a shit ton of money. So it's not anything to do with, oh, you're not trying hard enough. We have half the working population in this country making under 30 grand a year. Is it because they're not trying? No, it's because we ship their jobs away for crony capitalism because these motherfuckers bought our politicians and like what you're doing why I respect what you're doing so much is it's it's our job to take it back they fucked the constitution Patriot Act 1 and 2 the NDAA by Obama basically gutted our rights and gave the last two presidents at minimum three the rights to do that things that Nixon got busted for you know, and and put you in jail indefinitely because of a tweet because you have no more habeas corpus. But I'm the asshole because I'm going, yeah, that Russia thing, you're full of shit. Why don't you just admit that Hillary Clinton was a flawed candidate, criminal, and if she had an R next to her name, you would pay attention to her sins. You're doing the right thing. And you're sitting in front of the devil. And I'll just go ahead and say it. You won't because you're tactful. But you're sitting in front of the devil. You're sitting in front of somebody who is telling you to your face, regardless of who you are, with your family and your background and everything that he knows who you are, he's still telling you. He can't even whitewash it enough. I mean, it's offensive. I mean, how did you not choke the shit out of this guy when you're talking to him? Well, I went there to negotiate. I went there to ask for the whole pie. I went there to talk about the issues. I told them what was important to me, what was important to all those people who voted for me and their, you know, the, the families who didn't have the ability to vote because they're undocumented. I'm um, coming from a family who is undocumented, who came to this country in the 80s. I was the first one born in the United States. I know what that's like. I know what human suffering is like, not because I witnessed it, but because I experienced it. Right. I went there on behalf of all of those people that wanted me to go in and talk with him. Out of respect for them, I did. Every fiber of my being said there's no point because he's not going to budge. But I did it for them. And I'm going to continue fighting for them. Because if if that door's not challenged, he won't ever change. And I said, at the very least, we can drag him to the left. And when he didn't budge, because I called again and we, we called again on the phone and we talked. And he still wouldn't budge on Medicare for all. I said, then. You're on your own. You are going to lose on your own. You wanted me to come on and, and use my use me as a token. I said, I earned those votes on my own merit. I didn't need any endorsements because, remember, I didn't get any endorsements at all. None whatsoever. I ran with the help of people on social media, with the volunteers, with the, the little bit of money that we were able to scrape up. And I took off in a car, sometimes by myself driving hours and hours and hours, getting home at 2 o'clock in the morning, sleeping for two hours, waking up, making my husband's lunch so he can go back to work to those oil refineries that blow up all the time, Mm -hmm, and then mm -hmm. coming back home and taking my children to school. I did that. I I earned every single vote, being a mom, being a wife, being an activist, being a volunteer, doing all that stuff. And still, still this person is sitting there thinking that Oh, I'm going to be just fine. No, you, you either if you win or if Cruz wins, we lose regardless because you're not. Neither one of you is doing anything to benefit our lives at all. And I have four boys, and this conscription, this draft bill, is going to affect my family negatively. Absolutely, I do not want another generation being in war, inheriting a war that did not belong to them. Absolutely. Absolutely. I don't want that. I'll tell you, I'll tell you a, f- a funny side note. So 
quick background. I'm half Arab. My mother's Brazilian, right? And my dad's Palestinian. So in the 70s, we used to go to these – at the Wilshire Ebell Theater <laughs> – in Los Angeles, we used to go to these Fatah rallies. If anybody knows the Middle East and the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, Fatah is a party. It was Yasser Arafat's party. My dad belonged to that party. He was born into it. And we would go to these dopey fucking rallies, and he would drag us kids along. And my cousins would go along. And we would go play spy in the basement, you know, spy in the airport or whatever in the basement. We, we, we would ditch these things. And then coming home, my dad would go – we, we, we see these martyr movies. This isn't a new thing with the martyr shit. So we, we're coming home, and my dad's like, I'm seven. I'm a seven-year-old kid. And my dad's like going, so you, you're going to die for your country? And I'm kind of going, I don't know. And my mom's like yelling at him in Portuguese. No, no, he's not going to die for his country. You go die for his country. He's going to go to Canada. And if he gets drafted for Vietnam, he's going to go to Canada because my kid is not going to die in a fucking war. And this is my mom, not American-educated, you know, ninth grade, 1950s Brazil education, but knew enough <laughs> that the war was full of shit. We're not fighting for anything. It's corporate interests. And, you know, living in socialist Brazil in the, in the 50s, which wasn't like a democratic socialist, it was like crony socialism, if you could believe that. She saw what happens when the government just runs roughshod. And she was just so anti-war and so anti her kids are going to go, what? And they ended the draft around, I think it was 76, and then when I had to re- – but every 18-year-old has to, quote, register, even though it doesn't really mean anything. But to have a conscription bill signed, like what you're talking about, that is what Nixon got rid of when he ended the draft. And the reason they want to get a conscription bill is because more and more people are seeing that this is bullshit and that we're not going to fight for our freedom. We're not going to fight for our right to do anything. Really, we're bombing Syria. Why? You know, we're, we're, we're going to bomb North Korea? When and why? You know, everything you're saying makes absolute sense if you're a woman with young boys. I, I would start getting their passports ready and schlep their ass to Canada because I can see both parties go for a conscription bill and manufacture consent through the bot media with Rachel Madcow and Sean Hannity and all the rest. And you and I, people like you and me, are, are, are called unpatriotic or, or, or anti-Christian or whatever they want to say to justify this corporate agenda. I mean, so the thing with your conversation, and this is a long roundabout to get to this point, and I apologize. So Jason Crow and Levi Tilleman in Colorado uh, are running against each other. And Steny Hoyer, if you don't know this story, Steny Hoyer got busted by Levi Tilleman who, who taped his conversation, like a six-minute conversation. It's like a scene out of The Sopranos where he's telling this guy to stand down, that the decision got made a while ago. And I can't do anything about it. You know, this, this came from somewhere else. Hey, you, you just got to not run. And Levi Tillman's like, well, fuck you. I'm going to take this call to the intercept. And if you don't know the whole story, the reaction was hilarious because Nancy Pelosi commented on that. She goes, well, that's just everyday political business. I'm more concerned that he recorded the call illegally. Doesn't that sound familiar? Screw the emails. Screw the fact that it's in print that you cheated Bernie Sanders in the biggest electoral fraud in the history of this country. But, but was it legal that how you got the info? I mean, how do you feel talking to a person like this and then you and then you doing the right thing? And I know a lot of people support you, but you must get some backlash from the other side. Well, being in the room with, with someone like um, O'Rourke, one is, is not intimidating. I wasn't frightened at all. No, because absolutely. Again, again, it's, you know, it's, it's not about me. It's not about me, you know, personally. Uh, but everything that I fought for certainly is personal because again, I, I've lived all these things and I ran because I want something better for my children and their children and not just my children, but yours. And I wanted to do this because I was tired of having the same thing every time. I was tired of not getting the results that we deserved. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, absolutely. Ran on the issues. Right. Not on, not on the tail coast of Bernie Sanders, even though he's awesome. Um, but on my own merits and my own experience, my own convictions, what I've, what I've experienced 
And talking to this person, it seemed as if he just didn't care. He's just there for a photo op, which he ended up posting it afterwards. But it was great listening for me and, you know, getting uh, to know me and my ideas and what I wanted to make Texas better. What good is me spending an hour and a half with you if you're not going to listen to what the people have to say? What good is that? How are you different? You're not inspiring anyone to vote. You're not inspiring a new generation of millennials, you know, the young people to get involved. You're not. And quite frankly, war, to me, I, I don't want it. This economy that we're living in, you call it a death economy, I call it a war economy. Okay, fair enough. Either way, we both, <laughs> we both die. Yeah. Either way, we die. Yeah. <laughs> and we suffer. And again, it comes back to exploitation. Sure. It comes back to the the white supremacy mentality because we're bombing black and brown people in their countries for True resources. Story. True story. And we're here profiting off the backs of the 99% taxing, taxing them um, to death, taxing them to death, creating another generation that is going to be in the same cycle of poverty and war. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, they tell us, you know, that the legislators, the Congress and Senate... Um, those, you know, Democratic and Republican insiders, the establishment, tell us, well, there isn't enough money for your so-called pipe dream. Well, they're only pipe dreams because you don't fund them, but you have no problem funding war. Right. You have no problem right. getting tax breaks. You have no problem polluting us for right. your profit. I, 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 just saw, I just saw an interview with Howard Schultz from a, a, about a week ago online. Uh, the CEO of Starbucks, by the way, who this chairman who's stepping down, and by the way, every Starbucks employee, minimum 20 hours a, a week, gets health care. And he's saying, I don't know how we can afford health care. I don't know how we're going to do that. I don't know what, what these extremists are wanting. I'm like, okay, you fucking prick. Let me tell you what we're wanting. You guys, just like you said, we never ask how much war costs. That's the most socialist activity ever. The taxpayer pays for war. Pays for our kids to go die and kill people by the hundreds of thousands. We can't have that, or we can have that rather, but we can't have we can't have single payer health care or education. Really, it's seventy not seventy billion a year to pay for education, fund the state schools. Private schools another story. I get that, but to go to A and M, to go to Texas State, to go to Cal Poly Pomona or UC Berkeley, that was free back in the day. It was three hundred bucks a quarter to go to a UC school and a hundred bucks a quarter to go to Cal State school where I when I grew when I was growing up. That's the way it was. Just to give you an idea. You're thirty two, you've lived with the student loan thing your whole life. Uh, this was a phenomena for me. Watching this. And watching these grown ass men my age go, Well, these kids pay you on their own. And you're paying how much? I worked at a Cocos, by the way. Paying one forty a month for rent. I had a jalopy Toyota Corolla from 1975, got me through school. I, I, did, not pay, I did not take a student loan. My entire degree cost $3,000. And the sad thing now is that degree is worth 15 times more than what I paid, and you got less of a chance of getting a job because we keep shipping our jobs overseas. It's not that we, we, we have 40% of homeless people that have a job. And that's a statistic that I cannot say enough. 40% of homeless people have a job. I don't mean the people that, with mental problems and a drug issue that should be just in a mission. I'm talking about people that live in their car, can afford a gym membership, and then take a shower. And if they got kids, God forbid, they take them to McDonald's or Burger King or whatever and take them somewhere to be entertained until they're tired enough to pass out and sleep in the car around 9 or 10 o'clock at night. Then they all get up, they go to the gym, they shower, drop the kids at school, they go to work. That's the life of 40% of homeless people. And, and that's why they call us the working poor. The working poor. Because and we're it, working and we're still poor. It's, and, it, and it's a failed system. It's a failed system. We're the richest country on earth. And you, you're going to tell me that, uh, for example, I, I, was talk, I was talking to a friend of mine the other day about this. And we, we were talking about some different ideas. And one of the ideas that kind of popped into my head was, why can't we have a business subsidy? For small businesses, of course, of course, Chase Manhattan can afford to pay fifteen bucks an hour, right? But for 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 the small business owner 
who's not some mega capitalist bazillionaire. He, he might make a nice hundred grand a year salary with a shit ton of headaches and he's got the lives of 50 or 60 people on his, on his conscience because he's providing their living. Why can't he apply for a business subsidy to make up for the $15 an hour if he qualifies? You know, set up, set up a criteria to qualify. Don't just give to everybody. But why can't he? Well, why, why can't we well, do that? That's political will, the courage to do what's right, they, they just don't do it. Right, and that's and that's my and that's my exact point. We keep subscribing to this bullshit, and and then people like you, for example, who run who run a real campaign where you got real votes, and then I'm told, oh, a third party can't win. That's interesting. If you voted for them, maybe they could win. Maybe Gary Johnson well, or Jill Stein could win if you vote for him and, and quit being a bunch of idiots going, well, we don't want we want to vote for the loser. We want to be on the winning team. Winning team. We haven't had a winning team in 45 years minimum. It's, it's, I would like people to win, not, not political teams. institutions. Right. I, last I checked, right. my, my, my birth certificate said United States of America, right? Yeah, and, and, and I, I definitely can <laughs> yes, well, mine and, and, too. And, and this is the thing, too. It's like, you, you, I, I'm not sure you get this. I, I would be surprised if you did. But when I was a kid coming up, because my parents weren't Mexican, they weren't normal. You know, they were weird. Because you, you, my parents are straight off the boat. If you see my parents, they're right off the boat. And they don't look anything like what we're used to, right? My dad's an Arab Arab guy. My mom's Brazilian. She speaks Portuguese, which is weird. But I remember being told a million times, so I was at least 25 years old, if you don't like it, go back where you came from. And I'm thinking, well, fucking A, man. I, 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 I was born in Harbor General in LA, so go back where? I'm born here too. I pay taxes too. I'm a, I'm a US citizen, so go fuck yourself. What, what do you mean go back where I came from? I can't criticize. I can't point out something else. Why can't we have nice things? Democratic socialism works in like 200 fucking countries. Why can't we have it here? And it, it's not possible to the, for the colonizers. I call them colonizers. That's well, what they are. Fine. Okay. And you know what? I, I, I used to I used to like cringe at that word because I was like, oh, my God, that sounds so harsh. It's fucking a what it is. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like you and I were talking on the phone the other day and we got we got we had a few minutes and I want I want you to finish out the show. But um you know, we, we were talking about this, uh, about the manufactured consent of wars since about at least 1890 with the Spanish-American War. And what happened was is the U.S. empire, the nature of empire, the Brits did it, the, you know, the French did it. Anyone that's been an empire, Israel's trying to be an empire right now. Anybody that's done empire, they colonize until they can't colonize anymore. And if they can't colonize anymore, hence the Greeks and the Romans and the Egyptians. And what the U.S. did was they, they just swept the country and got from the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific Ocean. And w within a little over 100 years, they're going, oh shit, we're out of space. Where do we go? Okay, let's go to Hawaii and Singapore and Cuba and the Philippines and Puerto Rico. How do we do that? The people won't be cool with it. Oh, we'll make up a war. And so they pretended that the electrical fire on the US Maine, USS Maine, which was proven 1976, the, the, Navy, the Navy put out a report that the USS Maine was not torpedoed. It was an electrical fire. And that's why it burned and killed a bunch of guys. But yet we use that to get into the Spanish-American War. Doesn't that sound familiar? Because if you, look, if you look at the last 120 odd years, we've gotten into every war that we've gotten into on manufactured consent and a lie, except for World War II. But people act it like, all. right? And so you can talk about colonizing. It's like Spanish-American, World War I. We didn't need to be in World War I. Uh, that, was a, that was bullshit. I mean, on and on and on. So when you talk about we're colonizers. I want you to kind of expound on that as we as we wrap up. Well, when I think about colonizers, I think of invaders coming into countries and nations and doing regime change and imposing their laws, their petrodollar, their exploitation of the land and the people for their own profit. That's what I think of as a colonizer. And it's just for power and money. And I think it's for all selfish reasons, it, it doesn't perpetuate any kind of democracy or freedom or anything like that. How can you be free when you're so oppressed? How can you be free if you're so in debt? How is it that we are free and out there promoting democracy when we also fail to practice it in our own country? How is it that we're freeing someone from oppression when we're constantly oppressing people with debt, with disease, with um, toxic chemicals, with... Um, just different ways that they oppress. There's so much 
in this white supremacy mentality. And it's not even just white supremacy. It's just somebody wanting to be the supreme controller of all things. Right. But it, it's, this country was built on white supremacy and white ideology. Mm-hmm. And not everyone is like that. But those that are, that are pretending to be our allies, those are the colonizers. The ones that are our allies are the ones that are stabbing us in the back, that are constantly screwing us over for their own profit. These are things that need to be called out, things that need to be addressed, and things that we need to do to shame those people that are looking to to run for office that haven't taken the position to take a position and follow through. I'm sick and tired of saying, oh, we'll push him to the left when he's elected. No, because there is no pressure. No, there isn't. There is no need. So we need to push them, drag them, kicking and screaming to the left, get them elected, and we need to be the ones that are calling the shots. We are the ones that are going out there and voting for these people. We are essentially hiring them. So why can't we call the shots? Why can't we tell them what to do? We can, but here's the thing. They don't listen. They don't listen. Unless and they're threatened. we need to be the ones back in control. Yes. Unless they're threatened. And me right now, I'm no longer a candidate, but I'm very vocal. I'm very vocal. I'm an activist. I'm an organizer. I will continue to talk about the issues in any way, shape, or form because it's not about me. It is about the issues. It is about justice. It is about breaking that cycle of corruption, breaking that cycle of injustice. We need to break those cycles. And how we do that is to continue to make them feel uncomfortable. The moment that they get comfortable in their position, they're going to screw us over again. They're going to take advantage of us again. And we can never let anyone get comfortable and just be complacent and just be silent as atrocities are committed of, as colonization happens in the Middle East, as colonization happens in Africa all over again. For what? For mineral rights, for oil, mm-hmm. for, for gems, for diamonds, for whatever sure. resources Look at the that Congo. that place mm-hmm. has. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. That well, is what colonizers do. They yep. pretend to be your friends, and then they screw us over. Well, let, let me as we, as we wrap up, um, and, and kind of piggyback on what you on what you're saying. And I want to ask a question. I mean, you know, the, the everything we've had that's progressive has been the result of third party, the forty hour work week, child labor laws, women voting. They, the, the 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 government, the mainstream government, the establishment has never given these things to us. Civil rights, Medicare, OSHA, EPA. These were all things that were demanded. And then government finally capitulated. Um, so that being said, as, as we wrap up and I I'm, I'm gonna let you know let you wind up with this, why are the so called left or anybody for that matter, because people voted for Trump too, why are they enamored with voting against their own interests? Why do they refuse to see what you're saying and believe the lie? It's my belief that they have been indoctrinated over years and years and years of propaganda, telling them that this is the way to do it, this is the way to go. There's a hierarchy of how to do things. It's called incrementalism. And you have to start at the bottom and work your way to the top to get what you want. And in the process, you compromise. And every time you compromise, they use that to blackmail you to do what they want in their bidding. It's never going to happen with that hierarchy of, um, of that monarch or the oligarch. It's, it's never, real progress is never going to happen following that system. They told me that I should run a smaller race. They told me I should run for city council instead of running for such a big position. I told them, no, because I don't have that kind of time. I said, there's no way that I can wait another four years to bring about this change the way I want to, because the change that I want to bring for, for everyone is it, it's not just city council. I want change. It's not just my Senate district or my County or my, in my state. I want this, this positive progressive change to happen across the entire United States, because that's what the Senate vote does. It, it affects the entire United States and it affects the world on how we handle any kind of foreign affairs or militarization. It says we want to be a country of peace and we want elected leaders to be for peace and prosperity. Then we have to do it in a way that prospers every single one of us. It doesn't just prosper the corporatists. So whatever system that they wanted me to follow, I refused. And I said no. And I didn't give in. I didn't fall in line. And I hope that other people don't follow that hierarchy, that they go for that seat for all the right reasons not for political gain or personal gain, 
but to do it for the benefit of the following generation, for them to have something better. Following the incrementalism does not work. No, it, it doesn't. doesn't, especially when we've been doing it for the last 40 years. And then we have someone like, you know, Trump, who is a symptom of a bigger problem, right, right. comes in and undoes everything. Mm-hmm. Incrementalism doesn't work. No, nope, it doesn't. It and doesn't. we need to combat that with a more progressive view, a more radical view that actually brings about a positive change for everyone. Wow. Well, um, uh, on that note, I got I to gotta start signing off here. Um, you've been amazing. I want you back on the show. Uh, like we talked about before, I'd love to have you come back on a couple of quarters, or t- a couple times a quarter, rather. And, uh, you know, you've got a lot to say, and we need more folks like you running. And, it, frankly, what the Justice Democrats are doing and everything else, that's cool. But, you know, we, we've got to get more folks out there. And, and it can change. We have to start taking the country back and and start looking at other models and other ways to do things. We're not perfect and we haven't been great in a long time if ever without being great at the expense of somebody else so um folks my guest has been uh, sama hernandez and uh she's going to be around you've heard her listen to what she's got to say because she's going to be saying it if this stuff makes you uncomfortable it's supposed to so y'all sleep tight 